Tut may have had a short-lived legacy, but at least he didn't have to deal with a midlife crisis. Most of us are busy wallowing about our jobs, but Tuta Konami Rain was better than an HBO Max drama. Now, we've all grown up hearing about him, but do you know anything about him? Trust me, there are more twists in this boy's king's life than there are zigzag on the three-level zigzag road in India. From an unexplained death to an ostrich obsession, your history books have been gatekeeping you from the life of King Tut. King Tut's brief but defiant rule. It's like the old saying, out with the old gods, in with the new. King Tutankhamu was a true hero to the Egyptian people. You see, his dad, King Akhenaten, had gone a bit rogue and started worshipping a sun god called the Athen. He even changed his name to Akhenaten and named Tut Tutankhamun, which means living image of Athen. But when Athen, Akhenaten died and Tut became king at the tender age of nine, he was like, nah, good on this Athen stuff. Like a true rebellious son with a daddy issue, he scrapped what his dad built. He decided to switch things up and bring back the old gods. So he changed his name to Takunamun, which means living image of Amun, the Egyptian god of the air. Tutankhamun restored the old ways of Egypt, which included the worship of many gods and the creation of new temples. It was like he hit the reset button on the whole religion thing. Tut didn't stop there though. He went ahead and issued a decree that restored the temple's image, personnel, and privileges of the old gods. And let's not forget about those sacred shrines of Amun that had been severely damaged. Tut began the long process of restoring those two. He took the broken pieces of Egypt's religion and art and put them back together like a boss. Not that he had a lot of time to do that. His reign was brief and coupled with the fact that he started out as a kid on the throne means he had a short life. Between the years of 9 and 18, it's safe to say that he had to turn to anyone older for wisdom. But did they have his best interest at heart? One can only wonder allowed. It's possible his reign was a game to some. Just pictures tens of visory and Petri Belish. Now this was a young and likely impressionable king. Some scholars think that Tut's advisors and priests may have used him as a puppet to reclaim power for themselves and others suggest that Tut's successors removed his name from the momentum and records because of his associates with his reviled son god worship. Ouch. Talk about being erased from history. In the end, Tutankhamun legacy lived on through the incredible treasures found in his tomb and through the enduring fascination with his brief but impactful reign. Who knew a boy king could make such a mark on history? But fate had other plans for him or rather made sure he couldn't follow through on his. Puzzling death and mummification. So, does anyone care to take the best guess at how King Tut kicked the bucket? Okay, truth be told, we don't know either. Historians are still figuring that one out. He unexpectedly died when he was just 19 years old, which is really young for a king. When scientists studied his mummified remain in 2010, they found traces of malaria parasites and degenerative bone disease. If only anti-malarias were invented by then. But his death also caused a bit of a problem because he didn't have any kids to pass the throne down to. So he was succeeded by a guy named I and I was out to get him in death too. But let's talk about the backstabbing royalty in a while. Now here's where things get really wild. After King Tut died, his name was actually stricken from the later king's list and his momentum were taken over by his former general Hohemre. It wasn't until the famous archaeologist Howard Carter came along in 1922 
and conducted a systematic search of the Valley of the Kings that the location of King Tut's tomb was finally rediscovered from being wiped from records to, be, to becoming more famous than his predecessors with properly documented reigns. Talk about a karmic comeback. But the state of his mummified body continues to raise doubts. The poor guy was wrapped up so hastily that he may have suffered more in death. His body had some damage that occurred right before or after he died. Plus, when they were extracting him from his coffin, his body sustained even more damage. The injuries to his chest and legs led some people to think it might have been an accident, like maybe he had a chariot or hunting mishap, or maybe he died on the battlefield. Others think he may have been murdered. Who knows? Few evil advisors entered the scene. Maybe it was all just a big conspiracy. But conspiracy or not, the same ritual applied to him. We already know that the ancient Egyptian had some interesting belief about the afterlife. They thought that if they wanted to live again after they died, their body had to be preserved in lifelike condition. So they created a science for it called artificial mummification. Basically, they will use this salt called natron to dry out the body, then wrap it in many layers of bandages to keep it looking like it did when the person was alive. They will even take out the organs like the liver and stomach and keep them separate. Now, get this. They thought the brain was useless, so they will just toss it out. They believed that the heart was the organ that was responsible for reasoning, so they left it in the body except king tutakunamu doesn't have a heart instead the undertaker put an amulet in his body that had a special spell on it for the afterlife some people think this was just because the undertaker had messed up and lost his heart but others believe that maybe he died far away from home and his heart was already too decayed by the time his body was brought in for mummification. Heart or no heart, at least the man was buried with what mattered most. Gold to last generations, dressed in gold and daggers. Thanks to Carter, we know our boy Kin loved all things gold. Imagine having a tomb filled with all the bling in the world. That's what Tutakunamu tomb looked like. His mummy was surrounded by three coffins, the innermost one made of solid gold, while the outer ones were made of gold hammered over wooden frames. Our young king even had a gold blade dagger and a golden portrait mask on his head. Talk about being a golden boy. But wait, there's more. The boy king also had an iron dagger with a golden sheet, which was a rare and valuable possession at the time. And let's not forget the other 16 miniature icon blades, a tiny iron headrest, and an iron amulet found in his tomb. It's like Tutakunamu was preparing for a tiny Iron Age battle in the afterlife. The other rooms were jam-packed with furniture, clothes, statutory, weapons, staff, and countless other objects. You name it, he had it. What most really put Tutakunamu on the map was the treasures of Tutakunamu exhibit that toured the world in 1960s and 70s. His treasures can be found at the Grand Egyptian Museum in Giza, Egypt. But what's the best part about these findings? It seems that the iron dagger was a gift from his grandpa-in-law, King Charles Rata of Mintanin. Beat a toaster any day, aside from gold and ornaments, the discovery of his tomb led historian to a whole new world of the departed, the Valley of Kings. Once upon a time, the ancient Egyptian pharaohs loved to show off their wealth and power by building grandiose pyramid in the northern desert. However, as the times changed, 
so did their burial methods. In the New Kingdom era, they opted for a more subtle approach and started hiding their tombs in a remote location, the Valley of the Kings, located on the west bank of the Nile. In modern day Luxor, the Valley of the Kings was the perfect spot for these secret tombs. They were tunneled into the rocks and had hidden doors, but inside they were spacious and filled with lavish decorations. It was the ultimate VIP resting place for the dead kings. Tita Kanamu was no exception and he had his sights set on a grand tomb in either the main valley or the western valley where his grandfather was buried. But remember I, his successor, had other plans for Tut. I, who inherited the throne as an elderly man, made a strategic swap. I may have thought, why to waste a perfectly good tomb when I can use it for myself. Just four years after Tutankhamun's death, I was buried in a magnificent tomb in the Western Valley next to Ahmed Hotem, the third tomb. Some suspect that Tut may have died too young to finish building his dream tomb, but that seemed unlikely since other kings had managed to complete the tomb in just a few years. But wait, there is more. Recently, Egyptologists have been buzzing about the possibility of undiscovered secret chambers hidden behind the plastered wall of Tutankhamun's burial chamber. Maybe he had more treasures to show off after all, and they are just waiting to be discovered. It's like a real life treasure hunt, but with a fewer pirates and more archaeologists. King Tut's wild hobby. Indiana Jones, sit down, will you? Tutankhamun was not just any king, it was a king who hunted his own ostriches. And he didn't just hunt them. For the fun of it, he did it to show his control over nature and prove that he was a true boss. He even had a fan made out of their feathers, 42 alternating brown and white feathers to be exact. And get this, he hunted ostriches himself while exploring the desert to the east of Heliopolis, which is near modern day Cairo. He was a hands-on man, you see. He loved a challenge but even wanted to show it off. An engraving on the fans' palms shows Tutakinamo's heading out in his chariot to hunt ostriches and returning in triumph with his prey. This wasn't just any sport, it was a substitute for battle. And that's how Tutakinamo got his adrenaline rush. But here's the kicker. Recall how Tutankhamun's body was badly damaged before he was mummified? Could it be possible that he met his untimely demise on one of these daring ostrich hunts? We can't say for sure, but the placement of his ostrich fan so close to his body is, is certainly suspicious. So let's that be a lesson to all of you thrill seekers out there. Sometimes the most dangerous prey is the one you least expect. Do you think there's more to King Stood's death than just malaria? Did his wild tendency to hunt animals did more damage than we think? And why was he obsessed with everything gold? Let us know in the comments below. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. And I'll see you soon with another one.